If our kiddos at this time want to make their way back with Pastor Emma to head on out to Kids Way, they're going to have a ton of fun. Any kids, kindergarten through fifth grade, who want to go and be a part of that. As our kids do make their way back with Pastor Emma, I want to make sure that you uh, pull out your GPS here this morning as we walk into our time together studying the Word of God. Our GPS is a tool that we use each week during worship and throughout the weekdays to stay engaged together as a church family through the Word of God and prayer. On the front, you're going to find information about today's message and our series and a place to take notes because we believe when we open the Word of God, God speaks to us, so we encourage you to write down a couple things God is saying to you here today. On the back, you're going to find scripture readings and prayers, one for each day from the Old and New Testament, all relating back to today's message as a way to continue listening to what God is saying to us here this morning. This is a great tool to use with your family. It's quick and easy. We also post these on our Facebook page every morning at 6 a.m. if you're looking for a quick devotional to do before you head out for your daily work or school or whatever it is that you do. Well, friends, we are moving through a series that we started last Sunday called Foundation, trying to understand the foundations of our faith. How do we come to know the things that we believe about God? What are our sources? Where do we get our beliefs? Where do we base our faith? And we've been looking at these different ways that we do that in our tradition, and we've based everything around this theme verse that comes from the beginning of the Gospel of John. It's our tradition to read our theme verses out loud together, so will you join me in our theme scripture from the first chapter of the Gospel of John? When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see This is an invitation that Jesus offers to some of his first followers, and he offers this invitation time and time again throughout Scripture. When he encounters someone, they'll ask him a question. They want to get to know him deeper, and he'll say, come and see. The struggle is that today, in 2019, we don't have the physical human being Jesus to walk with, to listen to. So the question we've been trying to answer during this series is, how do we come and see? How do we learn about God? What are the sources we use to build our faith? We talked about in our tradition, there are four different sources that we use together in concert. We call this the quadrilateral, if you're looking for the fun, fancy church name for it. But there are four places that we understand who God is. The first one we talked about last week is experience. Today we're talking about scripture, the word of God. That's the the source that we hold most sacred. We say that scripture is our primary source, but experience is first. Like we talked about last week, no one can read the Bible in a vacuum. We bring our life experience, our own experiences with God to bear on the Scripture when we come to it. So experience is our first source, but Scripture is primary. It's the most important. Our third source is tradition. We'll talk about that next week. The traditions of the church. Scripture will call this the great cloud of witnesses. Those who have gone before us, we listen to and learn from those people who have been discovering who God is and the way the church has responded to God and the hurt in the world for thousands of years. We take that into account and build upon those traditions. And finally, my favorite part about being a Methodist is our final source is reason. We have long called ourselves a thinking church. We don't believe in blind allegiance. I'm never going to say anything and then tell you, just believe me. Don't ask any questions or go look it up. I'm always going to encourage you to question, to search the scriptures, to bring your your mind to bear on things. I love that we're a thinking church. We say that in our creed every week. We question and examine the nature of God so we might learn to tell Christ's story. That's what we believe. These are the four sources that we use. So today we're talking about Scripture, the Bible, our primary source. And to help us dig into that, Kim's going to come read one of my favorite passages from Hebrews. Today's Scripture is Hebrews, Hebrews 4, 12 through 13. Indeed, the Word of God is living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow, It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you so much, Kim. Friends, will you pray with me? Holy and almighty God, we thank you for the word of God that you bring into our lives. But God, we are so thankful that you help us to understand who you are by looking wide, by widening our gaze, using our reason, looking at those who have gone before us through the lens of our own life experience, our own encounters with you, 
as we come to Scripture and try to learn who you are. So God, help us to see through all those lenses what the Word of God truly is for us today, how we are to use it appropriately, what it really is, so that we can avoid the mistakes that so many make when they turn the Scripture into a weapon. Lord, may the Word of God come alive in our lives today. This is your house, O God, and we are your people, so we trust you. Use this time as you see fit, and we will listen. God, we love you and we trust you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Over my life, I have had a lot of Bibles. The first one I can remember getting is this one. This is my adventure Bible that was presented to me in church when I was in third grade, a tradition that we still do today in our church. Uh, This was given to me, it's seen better days, but uh, this was given to me September 17th, 1995, by two pastors whose whose signature I cannot read, as in keeping with good tradition, uh, preachers and doctors, illegible handwriting, so we're in good company, in Christ Church United Methodist in Tucson, Arizona. And I'll remember this day with anxiety because all the third graders were presented their Bibles. And so we all lined up. It was a big church with this huge pipe organ. It was very intimidating for a third grader. Precocious as I was, I was still scared. And I walked up there and I was like, what am I supposed to do? It's one of those weird moments, sort of like a graduation where it's sort of all about you, but you're not really doing anything. And so we all walked up there, and I'm thinking in my mind, and my mind's racing, like, do I face the people? Do I say something? Am I supposed to, what do I, do I hold it? Do I care? What if I trip? Where am I supposed to go? What do I do? And I was so nervous, but thankfully, as I have long enjoyed the privilege of being a Williams, I got to go last. Because those of us at the end of the alphabet never have to have that anxiety, right? Because we're last. We just follow the crowd, let other people trip over things. And so I watched as poor Abernathy and Anderson and Bates all had to struggle through this encounter. And I knew exactly what to do when I walked up there, which obviously was just walk up there and get my Bible and sit down. It wasn't much. But from that moment began this relationship with the Bible that has been fraught with frustration, with confusion. When I first got the Bible, I was like, yes, I've got my own Bible. This is great. Bam. It was an adventure Bible. It's four kids. They still make these, the adventure Bible. We're still giving them out to our third graders. But let me tell you, y'all, I feel so jealous of the kids now because their Bibles are so cool. These have like maybe six pages of pictures, which in the third grade, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the pictures. I'm looking for the summaries, like where are the Cliff Notes version here? Um, But it's mostly just words, right? It's just like the boring, it's just words. And so I got that in third grade, and I was like, oh, man, okay. So I've got to read this. Okay, so I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to start reading it. And I have had struggles with Scripture from the beginning. I picked it up, and I'm reading it, and I'm like, this is so boring. It's just... It's just mind-numbing for a third grader especially. But as I went through my life, I was like, I just can't get through it. And it's just, it's just rough. I mean, it's, as I try to go through, I'm like, okay, I'm going to make it. I'm in Genesis. There's some cool things happening there. Exodus, there's some cool stories in there. Leviticus. The number of times my journey from cover to cover through the Bible has died in Leviticus, I can't even begin to tell you. I've read Genesis and Exodus probably 30 times. I've only made it past like three times. But one time I remember making it through Leviticus and I was like, yes, finally, I've earned it. What's next? It's going to be awesome. Numbers. What's numbers? Somehow it's worse. It's like, come on, man. It's horrible. And as I was reading it, I was like, why is it, in the, why is it in two columns like this? Like, dictionaries are written like this. Books aren't written like this. Have you ever noticed in most Bibles there are these two columns and like every third word is hyphenated because it's got to go to the next line. It's so hard to read. And I remember going, this is frustrating. The Bible's boring. It's long. It's so hard to read. How am I supposed to figure this out? One of the greatest gifts that was given to me, if you're like me and you can't deal with all the columns, is when someone told me about something called a single column Bible. And I love this so much. It's all in one column. It's like a book. This is incredible. If you're, looking, if you're like me and you're like, I can't do it, like my head starts shaking trying to read the columns, get yourself a single column Bible. Amazon, everybody's got them. They are fantastic. You can read it like a novel. It's wonderful. Pick a plan to read scripture. That's what I was told. I was like, I can't get through it. What am I supposed to do? Pick a plan, I was told. Okay, so I tried to find one. None of them worked. The first time I ever read the Bible, cover to cover, was in a church after college. We came across this program called The Bible in 90 Days. 
We called it B90 because that sounded cooler. Um, and so we were like, everybody's got to go through B90. Everyone's got to do it. And the preacher was like, everyone's going to do this. It's going to be awesome. Y'all, 90 days sounds like a long time. It is not. 90 days is three months. This book, these 66 books, you cannot do easily in three months. So I was all hyped up for it. I was like, yeah, I'm finally going to get through the whole Bible. And then I looked at the reading list, and it was like 20 chapters a day, seven days a week for 90 days. And the pastor was so optimistic, he's like, everyone in our church is going to have read the whole Bible. And I was like, no, they're not. They may tell you they're doing it, but I'm telling you right now, buddy, they're not doing it. But I got through it. I was on staff, so I had to, or I was forced to make it happen. But I read all the way through it, and it was one of the coolest things because they told us, don't read very deeply, just kind of skim it. You got to read so much, just kind of skim through. You come to a big block of names, just skip it. You're never going to remember them. Just go, names, next page. Which sounded so counterintuitive to every way I've ever read the Bible, right? Like you get in a Bible study and you like drill down into one word. What What does it mean when Paul says this? And the teacher was like, no, just like race through it as fast as you can. And one of the coolest things that happened when I did that is I heard the story in the Bible. I never heard the whole story. There's a story, if you didn't know. There's a story in the Bible, and I'd missed it because I was so busy focusing on this passage, so busy studying this. And for the first time, I realized there's a story about God in our scripture, and it blew my mind. And so as I was going through my life, I encountered these frustrations, like it's boring, there's columns, how am I going to get through it all? Leviticus sucks, how am I going to do this? But I finally read it all. And up until that moment, Like, the logistics of reading the Bible were always such a struggle for me. But the Bible itself was so warm in my heart. It's the Word of God. It feeds into our soul. It's beautiful. It's incredible. I love the Bible until I read it. And I was like, what? The more I started reading through it, I was like, wait, wait a second. From the very beginning, they started talking about how the world came into being. And I was like, okay, but I've been through science class. So, like, Seven days? I don't understand. Like, so there's, okay, there's Adam and Eve, and then they have two sons, Cain and Abel, and then Cain has another kid with who? Is mine the only one that that's weird for? Like, is that also Eve? It feels, uh, you know, so I had all these problems, and I was like, I don't get it. Like, I thought the earth was 14 billion years old. Like, seven days? This doesn't make sense to me. Why does everything I learn in science seem to contradict what I read in the very beginning? I get to Abraham, and I'm like, this guy's awesome. Wait, God says, go kill your son? That doesn't sound very good. Now that I have a son, I'm like, no way. If God said, I need you to go and kill Henry, I'd be like, bye. I'm out. What is this? Go kill your son Isaac? I mean, he does like a swap at the last minute, but that's a pretty cruel test. And then I see these rules about what you're supposed to do in life. And one of them says, if you work on the Sabbath, you are to be put to death. And I was like, oh, I'm trying to become a preacher. That feels problematic. I feel like a lot of my work is on the Sabbath. What am I supposed to do with that? I read through and they're in Egypt and they're like all these plagues are setting people free. And I'm like, wait a second though, the plagues are impacting all of Egypt. Like Pharaoh's the villain in this. What, can you imagine just being like an average Egyptian living on like, you know, 14th Street and you're just going about your day and you're like, what are these grasshoppers everywhere? Frogs now? Blood? Like, it would be horrible. You wouldn't know what's going on. And as I read that, I was thinking, God, it's cruel. Like, this is a big splash zone. If you're just trying to punish Pharaoh, God seems really cruel in this. I don't get it. And then I read the story when the Hebrew people come to the city of Jericho and they're trying to conquer it. and It's got these big walls. And so they walk around the city for six days. And on the last day, they walk around it seven times. They all blow their trumpets and they all shout at the same time. And the walls come crumbling down, which sounds cool, right? Like you'd sing a song about this. But then I was like, okay, look, I'm not a civil engineer, but I know how walls work. You can't shout at a wall and then it crumbles. So just not how it works. So this, this doesn't make any sense to me. And I couldn't get over the fish. Have you ever read Jonah? I couldn't get past the fish. He's in a fish. First of all, he's swallowed and he lives. And then he's in the fish for three days. Like, is there air in there? What kind of fish is this? I don't understand. And then he gets spit out and he's just okay. And then and I couldn't get over it. I was like, this is, rid- okay, I got to get out of the Old Testament. This is ridiculous. So I moved to the New Testament. I was like, okay, we're going to have sane, normal things. It's going to be Jesus walking around, you know, helping people out. But as I get into the Gospels, I'm like, man, first of all, there's another huge genealogy at the beginning. I'm like, come on. So I get past that. Like, there are so many demons in the New Testament. What is the deal? Like, Galilee's just infested with demons. What's happening here? This seems so crazy. Why are there so many demons? And then I got to Paul, 
And I'm like, okay, Paul, yes, ah, this is great. Look, this is beautiful. He loves women. He's supporting them. He's sending them out in ministry. What a beautiful look of equality in the first century. But then I kept reading, and it's like, you seem to have changed your tone. Now it's like women must be silent. I'm confused. Like, you flip-flopped on this issue. I don't get it. Were you running for re-election in a different political district, and so you had to change your position? Like, what is going on here, Paul? Why have you totally changed? And then I got to the end, and I was like, the Bible doesn't seem to have a problem with slavery. That's not cool. And so the more I read the Bible, I was like, this is not good. There are so many bad things in this story. How, what am I supposed to do with this? And it really messed with me. And I thought, I finally did what I was supposed to do. I read the Bible. I read it all. I couldn't get over parts of it. I couldn't deal with it. I thought, what am I supposed to do with this? And then someone told me something that has always stuck with me, kind of changed everything with the way I see Scripture. They said, look, man, The Bible is not God. The Bible is a way for you to understand who God is, and it teaches you about the context during which it was written. I was like, well, but it's it's the Bible. Like, you read it, and you just do what it says. He's like, no, it's so much deeper than that. The Bible's not God. It's a book about God. It's a story about God, and it helps us understand that times were very different. This was not written last week over a weekend by one person. It was written thousands of years ago, across thousands of years, by so many different cultures. There's so much in that book. You can't just read it at face value. And so I began to go deeper and ask these deeper questions. And the more I studied scripture and looked at science, I was like, these aren't in conflict. They work beautifully together. Science is trying to figure out and explain how the world works. There are some times where the rules of physics break down. Sometimes God breaks the rules. That's all I can say. I don't know. But they work together so beautifully. The more you look at this and the more you read it. I could never get past the fish part in Jonah. And then someone said, just read the end of the book. I was like, all right, fine. What happens next? A big monkey eats him or something? So I get to the end of the book, and it's the best part. I never knew. If you've been stuck in Jonah and you can't get past the fish, just pretend it's a dream or a metaphor or it's not real and read the rest of the book because the end of Jonah is the best part. It's so beautiful. It tells this incredible story about actually loving your enemies and how following God is hard and how sometimes we love to say that God loves and forgives everyone, but we don't really want that for our enemies. Jonah's a beautiful text, but you've got to get past the fish. And I miss the whole story because I couldn't get over my baggage with the fish part. Paul did empower women, and he never flip-flopped on that issue. He was an incredibly revolutionary guy for the time. Those later letters that talk about women keeping silent in the church were written by somebody else. How was I supposed to know that? Well, upon reading on face value, it says Paul wrote it. And the more I studied, the more I looked into it and read deeper, there's so much more going on than just what you read on the surface level. And Paul was incredibly controversial at the time for his rule on slavery, the way he felt about it. Read the book of Philemon. He's advocating that this slave who had run away be welcomed back, not only not punished for it, but welcomed in as a brother in Christ. That would have been heresy at the time. That would have been incredibly crazy. But for us in 2019, we're like, slavery is horrible, everyone knows that. But this is the first century. And the more I began to read it, the more it began to come alive. And I saw what it really was. When we study scripture deeply, when we read all of it, and not just pull a verse over here that proves our point, or worry about a verse over here we don't really understand, when we read all of it, we learn about the culture, we learn about these people, we see their struggles, and we learn so much about God. But we can't take it all at face value because that's not the way it was meant to be used. We can't only look at Scripture. We have to bring everything to bear on our life when we try to learn about our faith. That's why we talk about four sources. Scripture is the most important, but we have to use our minds when we read Scripture. We have to read something and say, I, does this make sense? Does this make any sense? As I was preparing for this, I was looking for the way Scripture is used really well and the way it's misused, and I stumbled upon this list that's the 10 worst Scriptures in history. And I was like, oh, cool. The 10 worst scriptures in the Bible. Got to check this out. Like, what's this going to be? And it's a lot of the ones that you're thinking of. It's the ones that are about, like, just killing a bunch of people or women be silent in the church. It's a lot of these oppressive, um, sort of patriarchal, frustrating, or violent scriptures. And the one that always gets used is, uh, I think it's Psalm 137, where it's talking about 
the Hebrew people, um, and it's like, get revenge on your enemies who have hurt you, and um, dash the infants against the rocks. And people read that, and when you read it on face value, it sounds like God is saying, go pick up a baby and smash it against a rock and kill it. Now, anybody who knows anything about God is going to go, that doesn't sound like the God who says, turn the other cheek and love your neighbor, love your enemies. That doesn't sound right. Not an eye for an eye. You've heard that said. That doesn't, that doesn't seem to jive with that. So what's going on here? And this is such a common mistake. People will take a scripture, disregard everything else they know about God, and they'll hold that one up and say, but what about this? And the more you read the Psalms, you know this poetry The psalmist is writing about the nations that the Hebrews are facing, and the infants are their descendants. There's so much metaphor and wordplay within all of this. It's beautiful when you read it deeply, but so often we misunderstand what Scripture is when we don't bring those other sources to bear. Scripture is not God. It's the way we learn about God. Our text today says, Indeed, the Word of God is living and active, and I love that. The word of God is living and active. It's alive in our life. It's not dead. It's not some boring manual. It's alive and active. And the more I began to study, I thought, what is the word? I see that all the time. When they say the word of God, do they just mean, do they just mean the Bible? Because at the time, there was no Bible, right? They had some Old Testament, but there was no new. They were living it. So what is the word of God? And then I remembered the beginning of the Gospel of John, and these words will be familiar to you. In the beginning was the word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, who's John talking about? Jesus. Yeah, it's not a trick question, right? Like, in church, the answer is always Jesus. Well, it is this time. The Word of God is Jesus. That's what it means, the Word of God. The Word was in the beginning with God. And then we come down to verse 14, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. That's the story of Christmas. When God came to make his home here, came to be with us, the Word of God became flesh and walked around. And so we have words in here that help us to understand the word of God, the living and active dynamic God of the universe that wants to have a relationship with us. The word of God is Christ. That's God. And the words in our scripture help us to understand the nature and character of God. But the problem is there are a lot of people in our world, and sometimes it's us, that will hold scripture up as God that'll pull a verse out and throw it at someone, that'll read only the face value, and they'll say, this is what God says. Christ said it right there. It's clear. And I love it when someone says that. Christ said this, so it's clear. And I'm like, really? Christ said this? They're like, yeah. It says right here. I'm like, but Jesus didn't speak English. English wasn't a thing at the time. Well, okay, but I was like, well, he spoke Aramaic. Oh, well, I'm sure it's easy to translate Aramaic into English, right? And I'm like, one, I don't know. Maybe, I don't speak Aramaic. But two, it was written in Greek. So Jesus said in Aramaic, somebody else heard it, wrote it in a different language in Greek, which somebody a long time later read that and translated into English. So for you to say, this is what Jesus said, like is factually impossible. That's why we read the whole story. It smooths out the rough parts. It fills in the gaps. It helps us to understand who God is when we read all of it, because this was never meant to be comprehensive. At the end of the Gospel of John, John gives us his thesis, which if you're like an English teacher or someone who just really loves writing, this will frustrate you to no end, because his thesis is in the second to last chapter. Who, does, who writes an entire letter and like, oh, by the way, this is what I'm writing about? What? Put that at the beginning, man. F with a red circle. Around. Okay, so here's what he says. Here's his thesis. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Even Scripture says this isn't everything. We wouldn't even have enough paper to contain just what Jesus did and said, much less all of who God is. Don't limit God to what's in the Bible. God is so much bigger. The Bible is a starting point, but it cannot and should not be read in isolation. There's no such thing as being objective. Everyone is subjective. We talked about that last week. Everyone brings their own experience of life and God to bear when they read Scripture, and we're supposed to. That's why experience is first, but Scripture is primary. We should read the Bible with eyes wide open, considering all those sources, our own experience, the traditions of the church, those who have gone before us, and our mind. 
When we read a passage that says, take the infants and dash them against the rocks, that shouldn't make sense to us. And instead of saying, God is hateful and violent, which is what a lot of times we mistakenly say, we should say, maybe I've missed something. That's a lot more likely, right? It's a lot more likely that we've made a mistake than God is hateful and horrible. But we make this mistake constantly. The Word of God is active and alive, so much bigger than the Bible. But we have to read it all. We have to read it all and look through the lens of our experience and our tradition and our reason to understand who God is. But friends, the good news is that the Bible brings us that grace. John will say that it's not comprehensive. There's so much more to God, but what's in Scripture is sufficient for you to have access to that abundant light, that eternal light, the grace of Jesus Christ, the good news, the gospel is contained in this word. It gets us to where we need to go. It doesn't show us the whole picture. Our minds can't comprehend the whole picture, but it gets us to that point to understand who God is, to begin to realize how God works in our lives. But remember, God is bigger than the Bible. Scripture isn't a weapon to prove our point, and it was never meant to divide us. It was meant to help us understand the God of the universe, how God has interacted with people throughout time. It's meant to bring us closer to the living God of the universe. It's meant to bring us closer to the Word in Jesus Christ. So friends, I hope that we will have a hunger for Scripture within us to read it big. If we get bogged down in Leviticus, move on. You can always come back, friends. The Word of God helps us draw near to the God who already loves us, who knows us, who created everything. So I hope that we'll leave this place while having a hunger for the Word of God, that we'll read the, God with, we'll read the Word with eyes wide open. We'll bring our mind to bear. We'll bring our tradition and our experience to bear. Because in these words are the grace and truth of the God of the universe. And there's nothing else like it. Let's pray. Holy and amazing Lord, I thank you so much for all the different ways that you get to know us. All the ways you interact with us and bring us life. God, it is so easy to make mistakes and misunderstand who you are. We've been doing it since the beginning of time. We are prone to take things out of context. We are so quick to use the Bible to prove a point against someone, to divide rather than to unite. We use the scriptures to judge. We use them for so many things that they were never written for. They were written to help us draw closer to you, to bring a message of hope, the good news into our life so that we might come to know you more. So God, forgive us for the times that we make Scripture God and forget about you. Forgive us for the times we use your word to hurt others. And above all, stir within us a passion for your word. Help us overcome whatever is hindering us from letting that word of God seep into our soul. If we're making excuses about logistics and the way it's written and can't get through this book, God, help us to break through. Help us to get over those. Help us to read Scripture big, to fill in the holes for the places that don't make sense. Help us to have humility, to know that we haven't figured it all out. But together as a church community, we can draw closer to understanding who you truly are. God, we need your help in this. Misunderstanding the Bible is one of the easiest things to do. But luckily, you don't call us to do anything alone. So may we do this in community, as people have been doing for thousands of years. And let us also now join together in prayer, as people have been doing for thousands of years, as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.